Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is part two of the fourth installment about Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj and the last one. So I said the idea of Al-Islam being spread peacefully is a deceptive idea. Islam was spread under the banner of the spear and the sword, just like Christianity and so many other things. As a matter of fact, in the early days, Christianity was spread with disciples, but anyhow, that's politics. This is why Allah, my dear sisters and my brothers, took away the compulsion from anything. Allah doesn't want you to be compelled to do something. That's why he prohibited anything where you are compelled. Rape is what? Is when you compel someone to have sex. Stealing is when you compel someone to take their money without them approving. And everything, deception, you can go everywhere there is comp uh, compulsion. Allah rejects this. This is why Allah didn't answer the demands of the people of Mecca. Because if he did it for them, if Allah had given them miracles, then he would have needed to do it for every person that comes after them until the end of time. But Allah refused to give Meccans anything that they demanded because the Quran by itself is enough. This is why Al-Quran stays today and no miracle has ever traveled more than it needed, i.e. from not happening at all. Remember, Allah didn't answer the demands of the people of Mecca because if he had then on judgment day, we would have told him, Ya Allah, look, you helped them believe. You gave them, you, you gave the messenger a house of gold. They saw it in front of their eyes. That's why they were better believers than us. Why didn't you give us also the same miracles as you did for them? You would have been better people. Okay? But what? Allah would not allow this. That's why to them, he said, the Quran is enough for you. And to us today, he tells us, the Quran is enough for you. You see, the messenger of Allah wanted so, so much that his people would believe him. It's almost like they tell me, yeah, Muhammad, you talk a lot and you have very little actions to show us. The messenger of Allah wanted so much that Allah would give him any miracle, anything to prove himself to the people of Quraysh. They said to him, Ya Muhammad, O Tarqa fi Sama, or that you ascend into heaven, go into the sky, just raise. But with one condition, that we will not believe in your ascension until you bring down with you a book that we can hold in our hands and we can read. Then the messenger asked them, you know what, what you're asking me can only be done by Allah. I am just a human being. I cannot do anything. But even though the messenger gave them the answer he received from Allah, you know what, deep inside him, he so much desired to prove them wrong and give them just what they asked for to show them I am right. He so much wanted to be treated as a truth teller rather than being accused of all sorts of being liar and being bewitched and all that kind of stuff. He so much wanted his people to believe in them, just like you, who believe now that the Quran is the sole authority, you so much wish that your family, your brothers, everybody that you know would believe in the sole authority of the Quran. That deep sadness that you hold in your heart, that desire that you hold in your heart, the messenger of Allah had it. So when Allah tells Rasulullah, his messenger, قَدْ نَعْلَمُوا Ya Muhammad, we totally are aware of and we know إِنَّهُ لَا يَحْزُنُكَ الَّذِي يَقُولُونَ That you are saddened but by what they say. Just like you are saddened today. You are a Qur'ani, you are this, you hate this, you are this, you, you want to destroy Islam. So the accusations, the accusations are big. And that, sad, that saddens us. So Allah is telling his messenger, we totally are aware of that. Just like Allah is totally aware of that now. And he knows that it saddens us just like it saddened the messenger by what they say. And then Allah tells him, the messenger, and tells us, and he says, فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكَ It is not really you who they belie or they don't want to believe. But the wrongdoers, the transgressors, 
abjur, i.e. they deny Allah's ayat, the Quran. You tell him the hajj takes place in months. That's what Allah says in the Quran. People today say, no, hajj is only five days. You tell him Allah says that you can perform hajj in four months, in any of the four months, go there. Muslims will not take that from you. Why? Because at the end of the day, they reject the words of Allah. It's not a matter of you. And this is why Allah tells his messenger, counseling him, supporting him, comforting him. He says, وَلَقَدْ كُذِّبَتْ رُسُلٌ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ And he is also comforting us, Allah. He says, and so many messengers before you, Muhammad, have been belied and treated as liars. Okay? None came to believe them, just like it's happening to, that, to us today when we speak about the Qur'an. So how did these people behave, the messengers and everybody? And how should we behave? Allah tells us, فَصَبَرُوا عَلَى مَا كُذِّبُوا They patiently endured for what they were rejected. وَأُوذُوا And they were even hurt. حَتَّى أَتَاهُمْ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ Until Allah's uh, help came to them. And then Allah says, وَلَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ i.e. there is nothing that would alter the word, i.e. the decision of Allah. So what is that decision? That the circumstances do not control Allah. That Allah has certain rules and he lets the world go by these rules, but he will judge and he will say what he wants on judgment day. And this is why Allah says to the Messenger of Allah and to us, وَلَقَدْ جَاءَكَ مِنْ نَبَئِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And that has already come to you before some of the narratives of these messenger. In another ayah, Allah says to the Messenger and to us, وَإِنْ كَانَ كَبُرَ عَلَيْكَ إِعْرَاضُهُمْ And if their avoidance of this away from the Qur'an, fighting the Qur'an and they're turning away from you, i.e. what you preach to them in the Qur'an, has become so hard on you to bear. فَإِنْ اسْتَطَعْتَ Then if you were able to تَبْتَغِي نَفَقًا فِي الْأَرْضِ Seek a tunnel inside the earth. In other words, if you could dig a big hole in the earth, to fountain out fresh water for them or turn the other direction and aim for the skies, i.e., I, Allah, will not answer their demands. So you think, Muhammad, that if you went and dig a hole in the, in the earth to get water out or you tried your best to ascend the heaven, that they will believe in you? Allah says, and even if you ascended heaven so you can bring them a miraculous sign, so that they see it to believe, Allah tell Muhammad, go ahead and do it. I will not do it. And this is when Muhammad knew that Islam is Allah's religion. He cannot, he cannot tell Allah what to do. Allah gave the humans total free choice and total free will to believe in whatever they want. If they want to worship a cow, go ahead, worship a cow. If you want to worship a snake, go ahead, worship a snake. Okay, all what Allah did is produce guidance for them and it's up to humans to decide what they want to do. But on judgment day, that is when Allah is going to speak. And this is why Allah says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَمَعَهُمْ عَلَى الْهُدَى And had Allah wanted, He would have gathered them all together upon the guidance, i.e. the Qur'an. All, everybody at the time of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, would have gathered around the Qur'an. Then Allah tells Muhammad something very, very scary. فَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ So do not be of the ignorance, ya Muhammad. I.e. someone who acts out of ignorance and doesn't know the wisdom of Allah in doing what he does. إِنَّمَا يَسْتَجِيبُ الَّذِينَ يَسْمَعُونَ Only those who hear with attention, pay attention, shall respond because the Qur'an talks when you listen to the Qur'an without any agendas, without any preconceived ideas or beliefs or things like that, the Qur'an will speak to you and it will speak the truth. So only those people who pay attention to the Qur'an with attention will respond. وَالْمَوْتَى Those whom you read the Qur'an, they might... You see, it could be your brother, it could be your father, or it could be your friend, or it could be someone in the street. You tell him, Allah says in the Qur'an this, 
and they and they listen to you but it doesn't do anything for them as far as Allah is concerned these people are zombies they are just alive but in fact they are dead and this is why Allah says wal mauta as for the dead who are not attentive to what Allah says Allah shall resurrect them one day when they die and to Allah they shall return then Allah answers the disbelievers of Mecca who had justified their disbelief because they said this is what the people of Mecca said and this is why Allah didn't want to answer their demands and the people of Mecca said if only one single miracle was descended on him from his Lord if that had happened we would have them believed then Allah tells Muhammad and this is in surah number 6 remember the surah about the Qul tell them inna Allah qadirun ala an yunazzila ayatan say to them tell them ya Muhammad Allah is certainly capable of sending down one miracle it's not, it's not very difficult for Allah at all but and then Allah justifies why he doesn't explain why he doesn't want to do that ولكن أكثرهم لا يعلمون but the majority of them have no knowledge about what Allah can do but because he given them the freedom they think he cannot do so the true reason behind their demands my dear sisters and my brothers when they asked for this ayah to be revealed to them what truly went into their heart is they were not concerned about the miracles but rather about the ability of Allah to produce them or not they wanted to test Allah can he do that can he not do that if he can do that then there is something in it for us but if he cannot do it why should we believe in a God that cannot do it is the God of Muhammad capable of producing miracles or is he not? That's why Allah answered, Allah is certainly capable of sending down a miracle, but the majority of them have no knowledge about that. So it is clear in this ayat that the messenger of Allah could never ever have dug a tunnel in the ground, nor could he have found a way into heavens to bring to people whatever they wanted. And that's why it is impossible for the messenger of Allah to have been ascended to heaven. Impossible. But the sheikhs don't want to listen. The, their brains have become like rocks. So as far as Allah is concerned, there is no miracles on earth that can outweigh the Quran. Allah has poured in the Quran such a might and such a power, such an incredible force that Allah, if Allah had granted what he poured in the Quran, that human will be limitless. With the Quran, you see, if we have full wielding of the Quran, if we had full power over the Quran, if we could control the Quran to do what we want, there is no telling of what really can do. Here is what Allah tells us about a power that he has put in the Quran. That power is so powerful, so impressive, and so almighty. Embrace yourself, my dear sisters and my brothers, because you're going to hear something about the Quran that is beyond any human's reach, including that of the messenger of Allah himself. And if there were a holy book that was given special powers, it would have been the Quran. Listen to what the Quran could do. And it is enough for the Quran that on judgment day it will become a reality. Judgment day is the Quran becoming real. If I have to give you an example is this. When you, before you make a movie, you have a script. Usually, the director would send the script to the actors, and the actors will read the script, and yes or no. And then guess what? Then they go with the script on sets, and they turn the script into a movie. When you and I watch a movie, the action, the blood, all that kind of stuff, all this is nothing but the manifestation of the script. Judgment Day is exactly like that. The Quran today is the script of the Judgment Day. Today the Quran is a script.
We can apply it to make a nice movie in our life, but Allah will use the Quran to make a big movie, a real movie, Judgment Day. This is why Allah speaks about the Quran in a manner incredible. Listen to what Allah says. وَلَوْ أَنَّ قُرْآنًا And if such a Quran سُيِّرَتْ بِهِ الْجِبَالِ was used to make mountains move أو قُطِّعَتْ بِهِ الْأَرْضِ or was used to cut the earth wide open أو كُلِّمَ بِهِ الْمَوْتَى or with which the dead were spoken to بل لله الأمر جميعا Rather it is to Allah that the whole matter belongs to This surah or the ayat is in surah Ar-Ra'd The thunder This is surah 13 ayah 31 What Allah is telling us is this The Quran has the ability to make mountains move Yes today 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 but we don't have the power to wield the Qur'an to make mountains move. But had we been given that power, we could have. But that power was not even given to the Messenger of Allah. With the Qur'an, you can break the earth in two pieces or more. With the Qur'an, you can speak to the dead people. But Allah didn't want us to reach it. That's why on Judgment Day, before the end of the world, the, with the Quran, Allah will make the mountains go. With the Quran, Allah will annihilate earth. With the Quran, Allah will resurrect the dead. It's the spoken words of Allah. So the Quran has the power to control and order the mountains to move as it pleases. Subhanallah. You can cut through earth and crack it open, cut it and shatter it in a thousand pieces, and Allah will do that. And you can summon the dead talk to them and they listen and that will happen on the day of judgment when the Quran the script of the Quran will turn into reality this is why when Allah wanted to bestow a great uh, bounty on Dawood David Allah made the mountains sing the psalms the background with Dawood Allah says and we surely have granted David from us a grace, David the prophet. Ya Jibal, You mountains, echo back with him. You see today when there is a singer, you have usually three, four people behind him. That is the chorale, the, the, the people, who, the background, the singers, right? They back him up. So Allah used the mountains to back up Dawood, David, when he recited the Psalms or the Psalms. Meaning, Dawood would say, praise be to Allah, and the mountains will echo that. Life is breathed into the mountains. And the same thing with the birds. With the birds. Not only that, because of the power of the book that Allah has given to David, Allah, alanna lahu al-hadid, we softened the iron for him. David, Dawood, didn't even need fire to manipulate iron. He could take any type of iron, really any type of iron, no matter how big or thick, and the iron would soft in the hands of David. For us, we need thousands of degrees to do that. To David, it was just a matter of holding whatever iron in his hand, and he would mold it like your kid would mold anything with, with anything. But anyhow, such is the power that Allah grants the Qur'an. And then you found this in Surah Saba 34 in the ayah number 10. This is why my dear sisters and my brothers, when the Quran speaks, all else, total silence. And the idea of the hadith is the biggest deception that has been played on humans. I will now speak about the next topic. Does Jannah and Hellfire exist? The idea of the existence of Jannah and Hellfire is held true in the minds of any believer out there, be that us, or Jews, or Christians, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, anyone out there that believes in God, Allah, 
would believe in a hellfire and a paradise, each one depending on whatever it is they believe in. After all for us, the whole of Ramadan evolves around the devils being chained in prison in hellfire, right? And this is for the entire duration of Ramadan, that the whole month of Ramadan, Jannah is purified and that each day of Ramadan, a big number of Muslims are exempted from hellfire and taken into paradise. This is a joke, really a joke, because it makes the whole idea of Judgment Day being of no need at all, no use. But anyhow, and uh, so while many other hadiths tell us about that the, the Messenger of Allah himself had entered Jannah and has entered hellfire. And of course, when he entered Jannah, he was immune to Jannah because uh, you enjoy in Jannah, but it looks like he just uh, entered Jannah. And when he entered hellfire, because it's a place of punishment, he, he didn't experience the wrath of hellfire. So he was there, but he was not affected. But anyhow, one of such hadiths, uh, which claims that the messenger of Allah visited paradise is a hadith by Abu Huraira. I will just read the English, uh, version of it because it's an al-Bukhari and Muslim so in the Salafi sphere and Sheikh sphere this hadith is far more than authentic well Abu Huraira narrates once we were sitting with Allah's messenger when he said while I was asleep so this is the messenger speaking he says while I was asleep I saw myself in paradise and behold a woman was performing wudu, i.e. ablution, by the side of a palace. I asked, who is, uh, to whom belongs this palace? They replied, uh, the, uh, and also the woman, they replied, she is the woman for Umar. Then the messenger says, then I remembered the jealousy of Omar. So I turned away immediately. He didn't want to even look at her. So he straightway turned away and went away. Omar, who happened to be sitting with them, wept and said, is it on you, O messenger of Allah, that I get jealous? Is it from you that I get jealous? Let my father and my mother be ransomed for you, O messenger of Allah. So this is one hadith. There is another hadith also, okay, by Bukhari and Muslim. And this one is by Jabir ibn Abdullah, who reports, one day the sun had eclipsed on one extremely hot day during the lifetime of the messenger of Allah. So this is an eclipse of the sun. The messenger of Allah prayed along with his companions. So uh, today when there is an eclipse of the sun or the moon, it, they say it's sunnah to stand on salat and pray. And some funny behavior thing take place where uh, the imam should wear his coat upside down. Everything should be put upside down. It's in, it's, but anyhow, but they say that the messenger prayed that particular prayer. And when he was praying, he prolonged his qiyam, i.e. standing uh, while you recite the Qur'an, till they, i.e. his companions, began to collapse. Uh, ha, ha, began to collapse. Or did he stand like six days? But anyway, so the, the hadith, the Bukhari Muslim hadith says that the Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, stood up reciting the Qur'an until his companions started collapsing, falling down. He then observed a long ruku. Then he made the, the ruku when he bowed down. And it was very long. Then he raised his head from the ruku. And also it was a long... But you know, so the whole salat was extremely, extremely long. Enough for companions. The Arabs back then were very fit. They would collapse. He then stood up and did that again. But anyhow, he did that for four rak'at. It's, it's, but anyhow, all these things, the, uh, now uh, the salat has finished, he turns, the messenger turns to his companions and he tells them this very peculiar thing. He tells them, all the things were brought to me in which you will be made to enter. Meaning, any conflict, anything that you will experience in the future has been brought in front of me. I.e., I know everything that you are going to experience. Astaghfirullah. But anyhow. And then he added, paradise was also brought to me on earth in the Salat. 
so paradise was brought to me till I was so close to paradise that if I had intended to pluck a bunch of grapes out of it, you know how grapes, they grow together in one unit? So he said, basically what he said is in Salat, when he was in Salat and reciting and things like that, Salat, everything that was going to happen in the future was displayed to him. So now he knows everything. And then Jannah was brought to Rasulullah. Sometimes I, I read things, it, made me, it, may, it makes my body shiver, the, the, the hair at the back of my neck go, go like my spine. Then Jannah was brought to the messenger of Allah and he saw what's inside it and all of what he could see was grapes. And had he wanted, he could have just stretched his arm and he would have got some of those grapes from Jannah. Okay? And then he didn't do that. Why? Because he couldn't reach it. Why? Because Jannah happens in the hereafter. He just saw it. It's like you watching something beautiful in your telly. You put your hand, you can't grasp anything out of your telly. That is basically what it is. And then he says, all hell was also brought to me. And I saw in it a woman belonging to the tribe of Israel who was tormented for a cat whom she had tied but did not give it food nor set it free to eat from the creatures of the earth. And I saw Abu Thumama, Amr ibn Malik, this man is the first man, they say, had brought idols into the Arabian Peninsula. As a punishment, he was dragging his intestines in hell. And this hadith is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And I would say to this lie, okay, we all know that entrance to paradise or hellfire can only be done after judgment has been issued by Allah. No one can enter paradise. No one can be punished in hellfire unless and until judgment day has happened and unless and until Allah has held them accountable for their deeds. Because Allah says in the Quran that whoever actions are heavy shall have a good life. Whoever's actions are light will be punished. But the hadith here, I don't know. So the question comes here is, this woman from the children of Israel that you saw, messenger of Allah. Of course, this is a lie, but I'm just for argument's sake. Has she been held accountable? If he says yes, but the judgment day hasn't started yet. If he says no, how did you know? How do you know that Allah will not forgive her on judgment day? How? The other thing is, the woman of Omar, this alleged woman of Omar, performing ablution in Jannah? Are we going to perform ablution? Am I going to still pray in Jannah? No, we're not. Earth is where we do actions. Jannah is where we enjoy. So why would this woman be by the river performing wudu? Is she even pious in Jannah? This shows you the lies of people. No humans will enter paradise on her fire without judgment day. This is why Muslim minds are viciously manipulated. Muslims don't think. Muslim, uh, Muslims people today have been taught Islam in such a way, in such a manner that they will always, always depend on the sheikhs. Sometimes people send me the same question over and over until I get upset with them. How many times do you need me to tell you or the answer so that it sinks in your head? This is lack of confidence and Muslims confidence in Islam equals one out of a hundred. But anyhow, let's move on. Ibn Kathir, the man behind the tafsir, is an imam, is a leader in the Salafi school of thought. One day he wrote in, uh, in his book, the Tafsir of the Quran, how the Isra, what happened in Al Isra Al Mi'raj from start to finish. What Ibn Kathir wrote became a religion. So you might ask, why Ibn Kathir? And I tell you because he summarized all what the Salafis believe in and what they preach. And because Ibn Kathir is a direct student of Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Taymiyyah is worshipped in the Salafi sphere. 
What Ibn Allah says in the Quran that if your parents incite you, push you, force you to commit disbelief against Allah, Allah in the Quran says, do not obey them, but be a good companion for them in this life. So Allah tells you don't obey your parents when they tell you to commit disbelief and all that kind of stuff, right? And he tells you, but be good to them for the rest of your life. Ibn Taymiyyah goes the other way around and he was asked if a father is a disbeliever and happens to, uh, to meet his son in a battlefield, can the child kill his father? Ibn Taymiyyah says, yes, a child can kill his disbelieving father. This is what's being taught today at the university, and this I have studied it myself before. Because what Ibn Taymiyyah says is Islam. So much so that Al-Albani himself, the great sheikh of the Salafis, I heard it with my own ears, and it is on YouTube. Al-Albani speaking to somebody told him, if you do not read the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, who is a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, you are a deviant. So according to Al-Albani, when you read Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, his student, you are guided. If you don't read their books, their work, you are misguided. This is why it is very important to understand how the Salafis think because this is what the Islam is built upon these days. I will start with a famous untold hadith that you probably have heard of or maybe you haven't heard of. But because of the importance of this hadith, I will mention it will be fragmented piece here, piece there. But as a whole, this is what Ibn Kathir has written and this is what represents the belief of the Muslims. The Arabic text of this hadith can be found in the book of Al-Bukhari. It's either hadith 1331 or 1386 or 7047. So it has three numbers. Why I insist on mentioning the numbers? Because it depends on who prints Al-Bukhari. You see, Al-Bukhari is not copyrighted which means anyone can print it and you don't need to have anybody checks it. So if I, Abdul Salam, today was rich and I wanted to print a Bukhari with different sets of hadiths, guess what? I can do it and I can sell it in markets and because sheikhs don't know much of what's in Al-Bukhari, people don't know much, I can easily make Al-Bukhari say things he never said it. And this is a huge danger. And but anyhow, this is how the Allah's religion got corrupted. And this, as long as Muslims still believe in the authenticity of the hadith and being the hadith being part of Islam, they will always carry on being confused. They will always carry on being duped, corrupted, and on judgment day is a huge, big surprise. The hadith goes something like this. Samura ibn Jundub, someone who lived with the messenger, narrated, whenever the prophet finished the Fajr prayer, he would face us and ask, who among you had a dream last night? So if anyone had seen a dream, they would narrate it. The prophet would say, Masha Allah, that's what Allah had intended. So basically as it says, they pray Fajr, once they finish, the people are seated, the messenger turns and faces them and would ask them this question, who of you has seen any dreams tonight? So if someone had seen a dream, they would say, me, Ya Rasulullah, what's your dream? The man tells his dream and everybody listens. And then all what the messenger could do is, MashaAllah, this is what Allah wanted. Okay, now the question to ask is this, why is the messenger so nosy? Why would he ask people what dreams they have seen? And if he was going to interpret the dreams, yeah, we can say maybe he wanted to interpret, but he doesn't interpret, he doesn't do anything. Who of you has seen a dream? I have seen it. Oh, mashallah, this is what Allah wanted. Next. Isn't this a nosy messenger? Really, 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 this is very upsetting. Because when Allah, you see, anyone who interprets the dreams is a liar. 
anyone, even if it is a sheikh, because the interpretation of a dream is very, very dangerous. A person comes to you with something that happened in the past. They saw a dream. And then you take what happened in the past and you interpret what's going to happen in the future. If this is not a shirk, I don't know what shirk could be. Because a dream could be anything. Okay? The other day my sister calls me on the phone and she said, Oh, I'm scared. And I go, why are you scared? She goes, because I saw you, you had died. And then I said, and? She goes, I don't know what it means. I said, it means just that. It means not a thing. It doesn't mean anything. Because the only one on earth who was given the ability to interpret dreams is Yusuf, Joseph. And the interpretation of Yusuf was not explanation of the dream. The interpretation of Yusuf was anything that Yusuf said, Allah would make a reality. Whatever Joseph, Yusuf spoke, Allah would make it happen. This is why when two people were with, Mus uh, with Yusuf in the, the jail, and one of them told him, I saw I was carrying bread over my head and birds were eating from it. And the other one said, oh, I was just uh, uh, serving my king drinks. Yusuf told the one who was carrying bread on his head that he was going to die. Birds will eat from his skull. And the other one, he said, you will be back to the king. When the person who heard that they were, he was going to die, wanted to change his virgin. And then Yusuf told him, The matter in which you were asking about has been decided. I.e. it will happen. I spoke it, it shall happen. When the king saw the seven cows, the strong cows, uh, the, the weak cows eating the strong cows, when, Musa, uh, when Yusuf interpreted that Egypt will face seven years, if Yusuf hadn't said a thing, Egypt would not have. But because Yusuf spoke it, it became a reality. And that gift of interpreting dreams was only given to Yusuf. Nobody else. So when the messenger of Allah asked the people, what did you see in the dreams? And people would tell the messenger of Allah and he would answer, Masha Allah, that's what Allah had wished. How can the messenger tell if the dream is a vision from Allah or that it was just in response to whatever people experienced in that day? You see, sometimes you'll be, you see a movie where people are in Hawaii and they enjoy it and you go to bed and then you have a dream, you are in Hawaii. So it's normal, it's, it's clear that you were affected by the movie. It doesn't mean anything, it's just your subconscious playing a trick on you. So what made the messenger think that it was from Allah and that Allah has wished that? So we all know that when we sleep, our subconscious fires all the events that we have lived in that day and before. And then it classifies it in order of their importance so that it can retrieve the information when needed. So when your subconscious classifies something and you see it in the dream, it doesn't mean any, anything. It just means that. It's been reviewed. And the other thing that we should pay attention to, Allah in the Quran has forbade us from asking question for no reason. And the messenger of Allah knows this very well, that he should not be nosy, he should not stick his nose in people's affairs. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, you who have believed, all you the believers, la tas'alu an ashya'a in tubdalakum tas'ukum. Do not ask about things. If they were shown to you, they will distress or trouble you, or even hurt and vex you. So Allah tells us not to ask a question. This is why avoid asking questions to your kids. If you come to the room and you see your child doing, don't ask him what you're doing. Because they might tell you something they were doing, it's going to hurt you. And if you don't know, then it's not going to harm you. But this ayah is in Ma'idan, Surah number 5, ayah 101. The question is, why does the messenger, who himself knows very well that Allah doesn't like it when people ask unnecessary questions, 
Why? What does he ask? Why? 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 Well, when we know, when we read the rest of the hadith, then we will understand why this this drama was created as a messenger would ask people what it is that they saw in the dream. It's because at one point he asked people, what have you seen in your dream? And nobody spoke anything. At which point the messenger said, oh, but I saw a dream. Strangely enough, my sisters, before I move uh, to this thing, okay, the sheikhs, Allah sometimes is strange. The sheikhs wanted to explain Islam. They said that Al-Islam, the religion of Allah, sits on four legs. Since a table needs four legs to stand on, so does Islam as they say. Strangely enough for them, the Quran is out, completely out. And you hear this Allah, they will tell you, Al-Islam is built on four hadiths. Okay, what are the four hadiths that they say? The hadith number one is the reward of an action depends on the intention behind it. Bukhari. Number two, the hadith, they say it's the innovation hadith. Whoever adds anything in Islam that is not part of it, will have it rejected. So this is the second quarter. The third quarter is don't cause harm and don't endure harm. Don't harm yourself nor harm others. And this one is authentic by Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Malik, and others. The hadith number four, and this is what uh, I am after, is the guaranteed privacy. One of the good signs of a person's nice observance of Al-Islam is that they leave that which does not concern them. This hadith is by At-Tirmidhi, who with Al-Albani graded the hadith as good, and so do many other scholars. Now, if you perform Fajr, every morning you go to Fajr prayer, and someone asks you, have you had any dreams? What do you call this? Isn't this him putting his nose where it doesn't belong? Why should you care what dreams did I have? Maybe the first time someone asks you this, eh, maybe the... But this is a continuous thing that the messenger did, like every day, until the companions have to, uh, taken it for granted. Every salat, he will turn to them, anyone seen a dream? But this is, this, this is why lies in the hadith are <laughs> great in numbers. Let's carry on with the dangerous hadith of the messenger entering Jannah and Hellfire. I say dangerous because the meaning of this ungodly, human-invented hadith shoots Al-Qur'an, Allah's speech, dead, really dead. And it shoots it so dead that people no longer trust in Allah's words. You tell him Allah says, see how Muslims today are. You tell him Allah says this, they don't trust and they don't believe you. And this is a scary reality. The majority of Muslims in our times, just like they have been for the last 1400 years, and this is around the world as well, Muslims have no clue about what Allah says in the Quran. Believe me, they have no clue. If they don't speak Arabic, that's worse. The Arabs even worse because they read Arabic, they understand Arabic, but guess what? They can't for their life understand what Allah says to them. And if they read, that's why they rely 100% on the hadith. Okay? Because if the Arabs could understand the Quran 1%, they wouldn't be attacking the Quran the way they do. Now, one might argue, what about the sheikhs? And I will tell you the sheikhs. Those sheikhs know what is inside the Quran. Okay? But because the way they have been educated in Islam, themselves have been manipulated into believing the hadith is a revelation from Allah. So to them, either Allah says or the messenger of Allah says, it is equal, both of them are 100% equal. And this is where our problem is. Our sheikhs are brainwashed and they brainwash us all is being brainwashed to be away from the Qur'an. You see, Allah has mentioned in the Qur'an something. And when Allah is mentioned all alone, normally speaking, it's the disbelievers who have problem with this. 
Because Allah says, The hearts of those who do not believe in the, heart, uh, the hereafter are disgusted. All right? But, And when those apart of Allah are mentioned, They immediately are joyful and hopeful and everything. This is in Surah 39, Ayah 45. So when this is for the disbelief, but Muslims today are doing the same thing. When you tell them Allah says, they don't like it, they get angry, they get mad. But when you say the messenger of Allah said, Al-Albani said, Ibn Taymiyyah said, they feel comfortable, they feel at ease. It's incredible what we, where we are going to die. But let's go back to the dream. Let's go back to the dream, okay? So the, the, uh, the messenger asked him, then he said, one day then the messenger asked the believers if they had had any dreams or not. And when everyone kept quiet and didn't answer, he, the messenger, volunteered a dream of his own and said, but I saw one. Last night, two men came to me and held me by the hands. So this is the messenger, they claim, is going to start telling us the dream. Last night, two men came to me and held me by the hands. They took me to the sanctified and sacred land. But this sacred land is just a translation of the hadith. The, the, the land in Jerusalem and Palestine today is blessed. But it's not sanctified. And, but anyhow, Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa, the blessed land in uh, Palestine, Jerusalem today. There I saw a person sitting and another standing. The standing one had an iron hook in his hand. He would push it deep inside the mouth of the sitting one till it reached the bone, the jawbone then tore it off on one side of his cheek. Basically, you are standing, you have a hook in your hand, someone is sitting uh, at your uh, feet, you have their head on your thigh, you drag the hook right in his mouth, and then you pull the hook all the way to you until you break their face into two parts. All right? And then, once he does that, he takes off the hook, the face of the other person goes back to normal, and then he would repeat the same process over and over, i.e. inflicting this pain of tearing the face of the other one open times and times over, non-stop. This torture would go on, repeated. I said, what's this? The two men said, keep moving. And so we moved on. Then we came to a man lying flat on his back and another one standing. The one standing was standing at the head of the lion person, and he was carrying a stone the size of a palm, like a rock that you can hold with your hand. All right? And then, of course, the narrator was doubtful, was it a big rock? But anyhow, it says it fits in your hand. Then the standing one would crush the head of the lion man with that stock. That's all with that rock. After striking him, the stone would roll away, at which point the man would go to pick it up. And by the time he returns to the lion man, the crushed head has returned to its normal state. Then he would strike the second man again and so on. I said, who is this? The two men said, keep moving. And so we moved on. So you get the idea. The one holds the rock, head, uh, hits the head of the person, crushes the skull. Imagine how painful that is. And the rock goes away. The standing man goes to pick up the rock. By the time he comes back to the lying man, the, the head of the other person is back to normal. And then he would hit him again repeatedly. And the pain is infected on and on and on. So then we passed by a big hole like an oven, which top was narrow but the bottom was white. Imagine a bottle, this is a bottleneck. There was a fire kindled underneath the hole. Whenever the flame of that fire went up, the people were lifted up to such an extent that they would almost be thrown out of the hole. And whenever the fire got quieter, the people went down into the hole. In that hole were naked men and women.
So basically, a bunch of humans were almost like thrown in a bottle-like shape, and there was uh, the bottleneck. So when the fire goes up, people were almost thrown out of the bottleneck. And when it comes down, they go all the way down in that bottle-shaped hole. The messenger said, oh, who are these? The two men said, keep moving. And so we moved on. Then we reached a river of blood. There was a man in it, and there was another man standing at its bank. So the man standing out of the river had many stones in front of him, and whenever the man in the blood river wanted to come out, the one standing outside would throw a stone in the mouth and push him back to his original position. So you have two men, one standing outside, one inside. There was no water in the river, but blood. So the man inside wants to come out. The man outside would throw a rock in the face, in the mouth of the other person and pushes him back in the river. This process kept going on and on and on and on. So I asked, what is this? The two men said, keep moving. And so we moved on. Then we reached a well-flourished garden with huge trees. At the roots of this very green garden was an old man sitting with some children. In that garden I also saw another man near the tree trying to get the fire going, i.e. trying to lit the fire up. Then they, i.e. the two men who came with the messenger, made me climb the tree and made me enter a house that was better than anything I have ever seen. Inside the house were some old men and some young men, and were also women and children. Then they, i.e. the two men, took me out of that house and made me climb up the tree and made me enter another house that was better and superior to the first one. This house also had old and young people inside it. I said to them, to the two men who came with the messenger, you certainly have taken me in a quite a journey tonight. Why not tell me all about what I have seen? All right, they replied, okay, we shall. As for the one whose cheeks you saw torn apart by a hook, the man was a liar. Then they added explaining. He used to tell lies and the people would then take those lies on and spread them till they spread all over the world. And for that, he shall be punished like that till the day of resurrection. All right. As for the one whose head you saw was being crushed, it was because Allah gave him the knowledge of the Quran. But he slept at night, i.e. did not perform night prayers with it, and did not act upon the Quran. I.e. did not um, make halal, uh, did not act on the Quran by day and so this punishment shall go on till the day of resurrection as for so by here just getting your child to memorize the quran is not enough so pay attention but anyhow as for those you saw in the hole filled with fire like oven you know like the bottle neck one these were adulterers those who commit illegal sexual intercourse the punishment shall go on till the day of resurrection as for the one you saw in the river of blood being fed rocks, that was someone who dealt in interest, usually the riba. As for the old man who was sitting at the base of the tree, that was Abraham, and the little children around him were the offspring of the people, i.e. children who died be before they became responsible. As for the one who was kindling the fire, that was Malik, hell's fire, the, the hellfire manager. As for the first house in which you have gone, that was the house of the general believers. And the second house was that of the martyrs. This is why in our sad, pathetic, human-invented hadithic Islam, every Muslim's biggest wish is to die a martyr. Why? Because they believe they're going to get tons of rewards in Judgment Day. Even though martyr doesn't exist in the Quran, Allah never said anyone who dies is considered a martyr. But anyhow, as I said, it's the pathetic, hadithic thing. But anyhow, 
And then they say, now we will introduce ourselves to you. I am Gabriel. And this is Mikael or Michael. Then they ordered me and they said, raise your head. I raised my head and saw something like a cloud above. They said, that is your place in Jannah. I said, let me enter my place. They said, you still have some life which you have not yet completed. When you complete i.e. what's left of your life and you die, then you shall enter your place. This hadith in full it exists in Al-Bukhari and fragmented in Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi and Muslim. And this means that the hadith is authentic beyond belief. I, it's very authentic. Of course, this remains a hadith. As far as I'm concerned and as far as the Quran is concerned, it's all a lie. And I can spend here going through each and every single line and I can prove it's wrong. One of them, judgment day hasn't started. These people are being punished without Allah holding them accountable. But anyhow, there is another hadith also where it says that the messenger was allowed into Jannah. It says Abdullah ibn Abbas. I will just read the English translation of it. Abdullah ibn Abbas. Or, or remember, Abdullah ibn Abbas is the guy aged 10 or 13 when the messenger died. So he, he, he was three when uh, Rasulullah migrated to Mecca, uh, to Al-Madina. But anyhow, he said once a solar eclipse occurred during the life of the messenger. Again, the hadith goes on, the, the long salat and everything. And then what, what this hadith adds is when the companions said to the messenger, Allah's messenger, we saw you attempting to take something while standing at your place. And when we saw you retreating, why did you do that? Okay, basically what well, this is what's happening. Rasulullah was standing in his salat. Then they saw him stretch his hand as if he wanted to pick up something. And then he retrieved his hand and then he carried on praying. When he finished his salat, the companions asked, why did you do that? Now the question is, why were the companions looking at what the messenger was doing? Why weren't they keeping their head down as we are told? You should always look down at the place where you put your head. This hadith that is in Bukhari, Muslim and a few other books of hadith that is authentic. The companions eyes were all over around. They were all around town. So much so that they saw the messenger stretching his hand and retrieving it. But this shows you the lies that exist in the hadith. They invented this to tell us what comes next. Then he answered, I was shown paradise. And so I stretched my hand to grab a cluster of grapes. As I said, you know, grapes grow together in a bundle or cluster. So the messenger saw paradise and he saw grapes and he wanted to grab a cluster. And then he said, had I taken it back to this life, had I dragged that grapes out of paradise to this life, you would have eaten from it as long as the world remains, i.e. that grape will never ever end. As I said, this hadith is in Bukhari, Muslim, Malik and few others. So, was the messenger allowed inside Jannah? The hadith of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj says, yes, he was. Because the hadith says, then I was admitted into Jannah. And I say this is impossible to have happened because Al-Jannah is not yet created. You see, you have to understand one thing. Jannah and Hellfire are part of a life to come. They are part of a future that does not exist as yet. That's why they don't exist now. Because in the right now what's happening is life. When this life finishes, the afterlife, the, the, the last, the next life shall take place. The hadith is telling us that this life and the next life are happening in parallel at the same time. It's impossible. Two comes after one. You see, when you have one child, when you get the second one, the second one comes after the second, uh, after the first child. They don't come together. 
unless they are twins, but that is not the point here. So the hereafter will come after the end of this life. This life has to end first. Allah will demolish everything, annihilate everything. Then he will recreate a new world. And on that new world, on that new earth, and that new heavens that he will create, heaven and, uh, uh, and hellfire will be created. But the hadith, uh, the Quran says this, but the hadith tells us, no, both this life and the hereafter exist at the same time. And it's impossible because, again, Jannah is part of the hereafter. Just like accountability is part of the hereafter. Entering Jannah is part of the hereafter. Entering hellfire is part of the hereafter. Being held accountable is part of the hereafter. Not now. This is why Allah says in Al-Quran, فَإِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ نَفْخَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ And when the order is given that the entire of what exists now shall be completely destroyed in a single stroke. وَحُمِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالُ فَدُكَّتَ دَكَّةً وَاحِدَةٌ And the earth and the mountains will be lifted and crushed into pieces with a single blow. لا إله إلا الله. فيومئذ وقعت الواقعة. Then on that day, the day of judgment shall take place. You see, the earth, the mountains, everything shall be destroyed first. Then, day of judgment shall take place. And then when it happens, Allah says, وانشقت السماء فهي يومئذ وهي. And the heaven will be torn apart on that day. And it will be so, so weak. This is in Surah Al-Haqqa 69 from Ayah 13 to 16. In, the, in other different parts of the Quran, Allah goes into details as how he will destroy the earth, the mountains, the heavens, the seas, and the rest, how the seas will go in fire and all that kind of stuff. Then after this, Allah speaks about a second creation of the heavens and earth but with different settings and specification and it is on this second creation that Allah will create heaven and earth not now uh, I mean uh, hellfire and paradise not now look Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the total destruction of the entire universe as we know it now Allah would recreate another world with different as I said specification and sizes because th that earth will be big enough to take every single human Allah has created from before Adam until the end of time All right? especially that this new world this new earth will be host to Allah because Allah the great and his angels will come to that new earth on resurrection day where accountability shall take place. So Allah will come to that earth and that earth cannot have the size nor the specification of this earth that is today amongst us. You see, new earth, the judgment day shall take place on it. The, the, and that is the earth there were Jannah and hellfire shall be created. Allah tells us, Minha khalaqnakum, from it, the earth, we created you. Wa fiha nu'idukum, and in, inside the earth, we will return you. Wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra, and from the earth, we will extract you another time. This is ayah number 20, uh, sorry, so surah number 20, Taha, ayah 55. So for Allah, He's going to create us from earth. We will be buried on earth. This is why us going to live on Mars and us going to Jupiter and, and all these sci-fi ideas will never take place because the earth where we are today will always be our dwelling. No human is going to live on Mars because if someone gets to live on Mars or Jupiter or something like that, and dies in outer space that the Quran is not a book from Allah because Allah says from the earth we created you and into it we return you and from it we will extract you another time after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect us in the upcoming world then the accountability will start on that day
Once the accountability and judgment day finish, people will then head to their final, uh, final abodes, each based on their actions. Allah tells us about those who made it to Jannah and what they say. And we really should pay attention to what these people say. Allah says, And those who kept their duties to their Lord and were pious on earth and did good deeds, they will be driven on judgment day. They will be guided. I.e. they will go to paradise while happy. In the, Quran, in the English translation, they say in groups. It doesn't say that. It says Zumaran, i.e. as if singing and happy, dancing, children, all that kind of stuff. Till when they come to the Jannah, they arrive to the entrance. And its gates, the gates of paradise, are opened. And the keepers of Jannah would say to them, Salamun alaykum, i.e., welcome to Jannah, whatever you wish. Tibtum, you have done very well. Fadkhuluha khalidin, so come on in and you will dwell in forever. By the way, the idea that the Jannah will be open to Rasulullah and he's the first one to enter is a big lie. The Quran doesn't say, as I've just read to you. People who will go to Jannah, will all, we will all go in groups there, we'll be happy chanting, the angels will open the gates for us and they will welcome us in. No Muhammad first and us second. You know, I don't want him to enter first before me, why? Yes, he will get his Jannah, the highest, whatever, good for him. But I want my independence. I don't want nobody to be my master on judgment day. End of it. But anyhow, when people enter Jannah, they will say something really interesting through which they appreciate what Allah has done for them. وَقَالُوا Once they enter Jannah, once we enter Jannah, they say, Alhamdulillah. As I said before, Alhamdulillah does not mean thank you, Ya Allah. Alhamd means the bounty that Allah bestows upon you. So when I say, how are you doing? You say, I'm doing well. And Alhamdulillah, all what you are saying to me is, I'm doing very well. And that is because of Allah's bounty towards me. That's what it means. I will stop here and then inshallah carry on on the next talk because it's, it's going beyond the uh, hour. So I'll see you on part three inshallah. Salam alaikum.